This is Christy Winters with the Pushback Lash podcast, and I'm really excited to be here today with two experts who've made a big contribution to the project. Anna, could you introduce yourself first? Hi, Christy. I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Anna Miranda, and I am an associate researcher postdoc at Technical University Tessa, working at work package number one. And Nikita, could you give us a bit on your background? Thank you, Christy, for having us. It's a great pleasure to be here. My name is Nikita Dhavan, and I'm professor of political science with designated emphasis on political theory and history of political thought at the Technical University Dresden. And I'm a lead investigator in the work package one titled Gender and Justice in a New Age of Democracy. Can you please explain what it is you're contributing as you're part of work package one? It's been a very exciting uh, possibility to contribute to this extremely, I think, timely and relevant project. And I'd like to kind of illustrate our contribution to the project using two examples. So in uh, 2015, there was this so-called refugee crisis or so-called Syrian refugee crisis where thousands and thousands of refugees had to flee the conflict uh, region, the conflict in Syria, and were accepted in Germany. And on the one hand, the German politics of asylum was celebrated in the world media as a symbol of enlightenment values of cosmopolitanism and world Weltbürgerrecht, so world citizenship. On the And of course, the German welcome culture was greatly appreciated worldwide. But very soon, one saw the fickleness of this idea of global hospitality and solidarity. Uh, And this was in the aftermath of the sexual assaults that happened in Cologne. And very quickly, not just conservative and right-wing politicians and groups, but even moderate politicians and groups started demonizing refugees and migrants. There was this extremely racist neologism that was coined, refugees, whereby there were arguments made that refugees and migrants who were were accused and convicted of uh, gender violence would be deported. And this, of course, goes against the Geneva Convention and the principle of no reformement, that you do not, you know, deport people to conflict zones. And the justification for this argument was that those who wanted to live in Europe, who wanted to live in Germany, had to, in a certain way, prove that they conform to norms of gender equality and gender justice. And here we see already weaponization and instrumentalization of gender violence to justify democratic backsliding. The second example that I'd like to give to illustrate uh, our contribution to the project is the debate and controversy around same-sex marriage. Germany, unlike other pioneering countries like Spain and Netherlands, took a very long time to pass a law whereby same-sex marriage was possible. Initially, only same-sex partnerships were recognized. And here again, very quickly, the discourse changed, whereby Germany then started staging itself as sexually enlightened and modern. And uh, there was there was a, this very, very strong discourse, again, of demonizing and projecting homophobia, transphobia on migrants and on refugees. And these two examples illustrate the kind of normative dilemmas that we face when we are addressing issues of gender equality, gender justice, and gender violence. And this is exactly what our working package is contributing to the larger project, because we provide the normative framing and normative kind of foundations when addressing norms and uh, principles of gender justice and democracy. On the one hand, what we are addressing is the backlash against progressive gender politics. But at the same time, we're also exploring strategies of democratic uh, strategies of pushback against this kind of backlash. 
So we are trying to do this by drawing on global feminist and intersectional perspectives. And we here particularly take inspiration from different schools of feminism, including ecofeminism, queer and trans feminism, social reproduction, the uh, reproduction theory and care ethics, black feminism, post-colonial feminism, feminist disability studies, Roma feminism, to address issues of gender justice and also women's human rights. One last point, what we try to do is also disrupt this kind of linear narr narrative that, you know, a thousand years ago or a hundred years ago, things were worse. And as time progresses, things keep getting better. So we have a much more nuanced and complex approach when we are talking about the temporality and spatiality of norms of gender justice and uh, gender democracy. We want to challenge Eurocentric ideas that Europe is somehow an embodiment of gender justice and gender equality and that, uh, you know, these problems are imported from the global south. In fact, we turn it around and even make the claim that we in Europe need to learn lessons and we need to learn strategies and tactics that have been developed by feminists in the global south. And at the same time, we are also, by addressing issues of democratic black, backsliding and backlash, we are also showing that many of the accomplishments and achievements, whether it comes to legislations around uh, abortion, around pornography, around other forms of or, 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 or reproductive rights or other forms of uh, gender equality, that many, many of these progressive, uh, these achievements are very precarious and we are living, which is why it's very important to talk about a new, uh, in, in the title, it's a new age of democracy. It's very urgent to address the kind of uh, backlash that is happening against progressive gender politics. Thank you so much for that. Nikita, you mentioned democratic backsliding, but Anna, let's answer the question, why is democracy important? As briefly outlined in the first episode of this podcast, democracy remains a contested concept and practice in Western liberal countries. Against this background, what we did in our report was to focus on feminist scholarship that covers a range of approaches and highlights gender dimensions of democratic systems and governance. For example, feminist scholars examine how gender norms, roles, and expectations shape and constrain political participation, representation, decision-making, and political recognition of women and queer people. Therefore, democracy as a form of collective exercise of political power that guarantees parity of participation to all members of society Gender equality is a crucial value to democracy. In our report, we show that the quality of democracy is determined not only by the form of its institutions, but also by the extent to which different social groups can participate as members of those institutions and have a voice in the public sphere. The absence of women and other minorities and marginalized groups from the public sphere and political arena results in democratization with a male face or a male democracy. And this is an incomplete and very biased form of democracy. Therefore, the importance of gendering democracy rests in the interdependency of women's rights with substantial and effective citizenship, political participation and representation. Christy, if it's okay, I'll just elaborate on a few points that Anna has touched upon. So when we are talking about the importance of democracy for gender uh, relations, for progressive and emancipatory gender relations, I would argue that feminism and feminist theory has a very complex and ambivalent relationship to the norm of democracy. So if you do a historical analysis and go back to the birth of the idea of democracy and the practice of democracy, let's take the example of in Athens, which is considered to be the birthplace of democracy, the polis, the demos, was a very, very exclusive and limited idea. So only Athenian citizens who were free men were considered to be part of the demos, which meant that women 
migrants, slaves were not considered to be legitimate political subjects. And right from the beginning, feminists of all uh, varieties, so whether we're talking about liberal feminism, Marxist feminism, radical feminism, and, and the list goes on and on, had a very ambivalent relationship when it came to norms of participation, citizenship, and representation, three key words for our working package, for our work package. They, they talked about how right from the beginning, from the inception of the idea of democracy, women were not considered to be legitimate political subjects. They were not considered to be citizens. So we kind of, you know, drew on ideas of feminists like Olympe de Gouges, Marie Wollstonecraft, but we also drew on more contemporary feminist thought like Nancy Fraser, Martha Nussbaum, and also post-colonial and black feminism to show how right from the beginning, from the inception, the, the gendered idea of citizenship was exclusionary and elitist. Anna, could you elaborate on some of those ideas? Feminist theories of citizenship problematize gender-based disparities and women experiences. For centuries, women were denied the right to vote and the same political standing as men. Feminist thinkers such as Olympe de Gauche and Mary Wollstonecraft challenge women's lack of political autonomy. However, at that point, women's demand for equal rights were mocked and denounced as dangerous for the nation and society. The backlash against struggles for women's citizenship resulted in the Gosh being convicted of treason and sentenced to execution. Olympe de Gosh was punished for demanding equal citizenship for women and enslaved people. While women today enjoy the same civic and political rights as men in the European Union on paper, one must remember that these are relatively recent developments. For instance, Liechtenstein introduced women's vote as late as 1984, making it the last European nation to do so. The hard won rights are again under attack, with women, particularly underprivileged women, being treated as second class citizens and denied citizenship, social, political, and economic benefits. The enduring political underrepresentation of women in Europe makes exploring strategies that ensure women's full citizenship imperative. The concept of citizenship seems really important to your work, understandably. Can you talk a little bit more about that? In our project, we also try and address how this idea, how this norm of citizenship can be made more inclusionary, less exclusionary, and uh, more comprehensive. Similarly, when we talk about political participation, only a very small, very privileged group of bourgeois white men had access to political, uh, to sorry, public spheres, to civil society. So, for instance, when the German philosopher Immanuel Kant gives us the definition of enlightenment as exit from self-incurred tutelage, and uh, in more contemporary political uh, philosophy, Jürgen Habermas, the German philosopher, talks about public spheres as the birthplace of deliberative democracy, where bourgeois men came together to talk about very important and to, you know, reflect and deliberate about important political issues. It's, of course, uh, noteworthy that this kind of political participation was parasitical on exclusion of women, of migrants, of people who enabled through their labor the political participation of this elite class of people. Maybe we should talk a little bit about the practical implications of some of these ideas. For women, this is not just about incorporating females into male spheres of power. Rather, this means the disestablishment of the structure that discriminate and exclude women from power. A radical transformation that the historical achievements of both could not in itself achieve. 
let me come to the concept of so this was citizenship and participation and similarly when we talk about representation one of the key concepts for black feminism for post colonial feminism for for feminism from the global south is who speaks in whose name so when we talk about representative democracy it's very clear that uh, of course interest groups whether we are talking about formalized processes of elections or informalized processes of participation in public sphere who speaks in the name of whom who is heard and who is silenced when we're talking about ideas of citizenship and political participation and these are some of the issues that we've tried to address historically but also in the contemporary context i know that feminist theory and feminist research puts a lot of emphasis on lived experiences and and i think you had something to say about your lived experience as a migrant I have experienced the importance of citizenship and the possibilities it enables or blocks. As a Mexican woman of color, my passport gives me certain rights and limits others. For example, I cannot travel without a visa to most countries in the global north or vote in the country where I live and work. My partner, on the other hand, a European citizen, is granted the right to vote at the local election level in Berlin where we live, a right which is denied to me. As a foreigner resident, I have restricted citizenship rights and cannot vote despite working, paying taxes and complying with the law. To understand better why this is the case or why this happens, the notion of subalternity, one of the central concepts of feminist postcolonial theory, comes into play. Spivak explains that when a citizen cannot claim the public sphere, a certain form of subalternity is reproduced. The precarious position of subalterns exclude them from access to democratic membership, membership and decision making. Democratic participation is impossible as their claims are not acknowledged like those of more privileged citizens. Social differences such as race, class, ethnicity, gender, disability, among others, preclude the recognition of these democratic voices or reproduce forms of discrimination and exclusion. For Spivak, the goal is to enable discriminated and subaltern groups to make claims on the state within the formal grammar of rights and citizenship and to activate a democracy from below. Spivak argues that democracy is not just about economic empowerment, rather it entails putting every citizen, even if abstractly, into a position of being able to govern. In the course of this conversation, you've mentioned backlash and democratic backsliding. Can you speak a little bit more to those terms? Yeah. So another very, uh, the, the concept that I've used several times uh, throughout my input is ambivalence. And here again, we encounter another feminist conundrum, and that is the relationship of feminism to law. And here feminism kind of on the one hand draws on law, to deliver justice but at the same time there is a kind of vigilance there is a certain awareness that although law promises justice law does not always deliver justice and this works very well in german because the word for law in german is recht and the word for justice in german is gerechtigkeit so it's interesting to note that the word recht is embedded in the notion of Gerechtigkeit. And this kind of alludes to this very, very complex relationship between law and justice. And this brings us to the notion of democratic backsliding, because the notion, the concept of backsliding actually comes from juridical discourses. And here, as, as is entailed in the term, so in some ways, it's also self-explanatory, it shows that some progressive legal measures are in a certain way, uh, there, there is a rollback on these legal measures. And one of the best examples to explain democratic backsliding are the debates and controversies around abortion laws. So feminists all over the globe struggled for reproductive right to have autonomy, to have sovereignty, to have the choice 
to make decisions about their body. And, and we are experiencing a very, very grave backlash against feminist achievements and accomplishments the world over. So whether it's the US, and this is also the fear now with the right-wing government coming to power in Argentina, this is something that was uh, till recently the fear in Poland. Thankfully, the, uh, the new elections have provided a respite. So across the board, feminists are seeing that the achievements that have been accomplished in the last decades are extremely precarious, that uh, any moment there can be a rollback, there can be somehow that uh, these progressive laws can be undone, they can be overturned. And this is why democratic backsliding is a key concept when we are addressing and engaging with concepts of gender justice and women's human rights. So, yeah, I would like to add that why the concept of backlash is so important for feminist theory. This was coined by Susa Faludi, and she explains, or in this very important book, um, she explores how movements arise uh, against the feminism, and as Nikita already mentioned, against all these progressive politics and laws. I would like to mention another example a widespread form of anti-feminist and anti-gender movement, which questions the concept of gender and discredit this important notion and call it gender ideology. And this is a discursive strategy devised by the Vatican and adopted by various actors to challenge feminism ideas and agendas. And this is precisely what Nikita already mentioned uh, recently in the case of Argentina and many countries in Eastern Europe are fighting equal rights for women and queer people. And these forms of anti-feminists opposed to contemporary feminist movements in a way that it's really a problem for women's equality and gender justice and, and therefore it's it, it's a challenge to democracy and that's why we have to take it seriously. So maybe uh, Christy I'll just pick up a few points that Anna addressed here to um, once again illustrate how what what is somehow the unique um, insights that our working package uh, work package offers because of course there are several publications, there's lots happening in scholarship and activism and advocacy on these issues. So what is what is unique, what is singular, what is innovative in our uh, project? First of all, I think it's quite ambitious in its scope because we try and bring, to, bring together intersectional and transnational perspectives. Of course, the framing is in Europe, and yet we um, we make sure that we do not fall into the trap of Eurocentrism, that our methodology, that our scholarship is not limited to only feminism, which is somehow based in Europe, but rather we, we draw insights from various schools and various kind of uh, perspectives in feminism. So here already we are very inspired by the intersectional approach where we address multiple categories such as race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexuality, disability, migratory status and religion when we are analyzing issues of gender justice, women's human rights, when we are kind of, you know, uh, focusing and are unpacking how democratic backs backlash and backsliding works. And at the same time, another very important uh, issue for us when uh, we undertook our research was when we talk about Eurocentrism, we also made sure that we take into consideration the insights and lessons from East European feminisms. And here we greatly, greatly profited from colleagues uh, who are part of the project from Hungary, from Poland, who provided very important examples, historical examples, but also contemporary uh, examples to enrich our understanding of how a democratic backlash uh, or uh, a democratic backsliding and backlash functions. So just to give you one concrete example, one particularly important intervention was the perspectives of Roma feminism. The Romas and Sintis are the biggest minority in Europe and very, very often, whether it comes to scholarship or advocacy, they are invisibilized. And um, it was an extremely important aspect 
of our report but also of our analysis of our group work together with other colleagues to understand i i started off my intervention by giving the example of weaponization and instrumentalization of gender violence and roma feminism provides an excellent excellent analysis of how gender violence is mobilized is deployed by conservative by right wing groups to demonize minorities and to kind of somehow stereotype them as particularly violent as particularly threatening to society on the one hand so roma men are demonized as a threat to democratic values a threat to gender equality and in the same breath roma women roma children are victimized as you know as those who need to be rescued by uh, emancipatory nar- narratives of gender justice and women's human rights so what we've tried to do in our project is be very vigilant about certain biases certain uh, how how discourses invisibilize the voices of certain minority groups and to try and uh, address and uh, try and include their perspectives now that you you mentioned how like some forms of feminism represent or exclude uh, other groups and how certain phenomena like gender based violence are instrumentalized by governments and this uh, wide ring politics i just was thinking uh, of my own experience and some years ago I experience how some women from the global north in this case Germany see and comprehend feminist movements in the global south and my experience is this uh, during a dinner after a conference on critical theory a women scholar asked me and you guys in Mexico in which wave are you in the first one or the second one referring to the metaphor used to explain and reconstruct the history of feminist movements that it's mostly accurate for the global north so after a brief pause i replied bluntly that's a very eurocentric question and since then i have been interested in the dominant version of feminism from the global north and its effort to empower and emancipate their suppressed sisters and the way how they portray them and somehow establish um, ways of solidarity but this form of solidarity feels still uh, very problematic and i know nikita that you have been working a lot on global sisterhood and transnational feminism and maybe you can say a little bit more about this we were like kind of you know moving to the question of what would uh, what would gender justice look like what would democracy look like or um, what would gender equality sorry look like in this new age of democracy and i think that there has been a very important critique against ideas of global sisterhood let me first explain the notion so this uh, emerged in the 70s where there was this presumption that women irrespective of uh, race class gender sexuality uh, nationality able bodiedness religion all share or or all have a common experience of gendered violence and that there is one universal kind of discourse but also one universal structure of patriarchy and so by virtue of having this common experience this shared experience of gender violence there is a certain organic tr- uh, feminist alliance building that emerges and i think this is in a certain way been an achievement and accomplishment of black feminism of of post colonial feminism of roma feminism of intersectional feminism of feminist disability studies queer feminism jewish feminism to show that when we focus on sexism when we focus on transphobia we should simultaneously address also other forms of discrimination like anti anti semitism racism anti muslim racism anti roma and sinti racism able bodiedness and 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 i i i will not be able to give a exhaustive list so when we look forward if we are you know trying to envision feminist utopias one of the most important strategies and tactics that we need to consider is a pluralization a heterogenization of our uh, perspectives of discrimination of our um, of our understanding of gender violence of our understanding 
of who are perpetrators and who are victims. We need a much more complex and nuanced understanding of power as well as resistance. The second, I think, very important uh, aspect to consider when we are thinking about transnational fem feminist alliance building is a kind of a epistemic humility where we do not take these norms. We need, of course, these norms. So that's again brings us back to the conundrum. On the one hand, we need these norms. We need these principles for our emancipatory projects. But at the same time, I think it's very, very important to question these norms also. So as pointed out by Anna uh, in her example, we have a very, very, you know, normative understanding also of how feminist activism is described. So in Europe, in the global north, we speak about first wave, second wave, third wave. And there is a certain linear temporality that's charted whereby feminists from the other regions of the world are somehow placed behind um, and need to catch up with feminists in the global north and in the first world. And I think here it's very important to rethink, reconsider, recode, relexicalize our narrative of feminist emancipation, uh, the project of feminist emancipation and gender equality, and that we need to, even as we use these principles, even as we use these concepts, we need to, and I'm not talking about second guessing. So a lot of people say uh, that this will lead to paralysis, that will lead to a crisis of feminism if we constantly, this was exactly also the kind of accusations which was made against, you know, the gender turn in feminism when they said that, you know, if you start questioning the category of women itself, how can there be feminism? And as we've seen in the last 10 and 20 years, that actually the questioning of the the, the biologistic, the essentialist category of women has actually emancipated the feminist project. It has not in a certain way debilitated the, uh, the feminist project. It has actually led to a heterogenization and pluralization of the feminist project. And similarly, we would argue that in order to pursue feminism in an age of democracy, we need to somehow pluralize and heterogenize our strategies and tactics. We need to have the ability to learn from other um, forms of feminist scholarship and feminist activism in other parts, other regions of the world. And at the same time, we have to constantly question the vocabulary that we are using, the grammar of feminism. I'll, I'll just maybe perhaps wrap up my comments with a very concrete example. When we talk about notions of gender justice, when we talk about concepts of women's human rights, we have to be aware that we are speaking in a certain language. Right now, for example, I'm speaking in English. And if I were to give this input in German, it would sound different by the very virtue of the fact that the concepts and the connotation are different. I speak three other languages. I speak three Indian languages, vernacular languages. And if I were to give this input in Hindi, or if I were to give it in Marathi, or if I were to give it in Punjabi, or if Anna were to speak in Spanish, the whole conversation would be different because language is a very important part. It shapes our discourse. So insofar as uh, we are committed to the project of gender justice, we are committed to pushing back against democratic backsliding and democratic uh, and backlash against gender equality and gender justice. We need to, it is absolutely urgent and imperative that we need to be committed to pluralizing and heterog heterogenizing our understanding of gender justice and women's human rights. I would just like to add that the focus of the project on a feminist utopian ideal of gender encompasses the desire for a, something qualitatively new. And this doesn't mean merely an abstract or ideological invocation of a general normative idea, but rather a form of self-critique that enables material as well as symbolic changes to really achieve gender equality and justice. Gender justice in a new age of democracy means fostering democratic participation and activating the agency of traditionally marginalized groups, such as Black, Roma, immigrant, indigenous, and Muslim women, all often excluded 
from decision-making processes, therefore we must recognize them as legitimate political subjects. In this sense, elite transnational feminists must unlearn that they are problem solvers and must develop intellectual humility. This would involve listening to solutions generated by subaltern women and opening pathways to facilitate their inclusion in democratic practices also within the global north. I think it would be important to highlight uh, that although it's the two of us who are speaking today, but uh, this is a group effort. A lot of colleagues from different work packages contributed. Uh, so it's a team effort and that uh, we really look forward. This has just been the first year. We've just been working together for 12 months now and uh, there is much more to come. We have much more questions than answers at this point and there is a long way to go. We have another uh, 24 months to go. And we look forward to continuing the conversation with our colleagues and we look forward to new tactics and strategies against this backlash uh, against uh, gender equality and gender justice. That's great. I think we'll leave it there. Thank you both for your time, your expertise, and also for the deliverable that is the basis for this conversation. And if you in the audience would like to get more on this topic, I, I strongly encourage you to check out the Push Backlash website where you can see this deliverable. It's available as a PDF. Or if you prefer to have things read out to you, it is also available as a sort of podcast. I, I went ahead and had it read out and it's available in a playlist in sections. So you can listen to it on a playlist. You can hear it, stop it, come back. But I strongly encourage you to take advantage of the knowledge and expertise that these two have provided to the project so far. So thank you all for listening and we will see you in the next episode of the Pushback Lash podcast.